Thank you. Before I start, I should introduce myself. My role at the University of uh, Queensland University of Technology is that of Associate Director, Academic Quality and Standards. And in that role, um, I have leadership over two portfolio areas. The first one is um, evaluation of courses, which is Bachelor of Business Accounting, would be a course in our terms. Um, courses, uh, units, which is a subject like Information 101 and uh, teaching and student experience. So that's the first portfolio area that I have. The second one is course quality assurance. And I've been leading those two areas since 2007. And it's been my privilege to first of all adopt, I, was, I, I came into the university and they had an online system already established. So I sort of adopted a system and then I've been able to facilitate the bringing in of another system in evaluation. So. Um, and I, ca I became interested in this area because when I was doing my PhD, I was trying to look at evaluation of teaching. I came from vocational education. I had to have a Bachelor of Adult Education to teach in that area. When I came into higher education in New South Wales, I couldn't understand why everybody didn't have an edu education ac qualification. I was quite bemused by this because in one sector in New South Wales, it was a, a, a legislative requirement, but in higher education, it was not. So my interest was in teacher evaluation. But when I did my research, I found out it was very difficult to document teacher evaluation when there was no actual documentation of what the policy that the government was actually imposing on the sector was having on teachers. So my PhD was about policy borrowing and I looked at the um, 2002 review of higher education to see what were the implications for learning and teaching in Australia for that sector. So while I was doing that, I was collecting data about whether the, there was any impact from this policy environment. And the data I was collecting was employment opportunities for academics across the country. While I was doing that, I found a job application for Queensland University of Technology and I was quite surprised in a three year period, no other university had advertised that they wanted to employ an educator in a unit, a learning and teaching unit, and they wanted to know how to use the data. So it was the only position that was not about collecting data about teaching, it was actually about data usage, ethical application of usage, and how can we build capacity in academic staff. So I actually, um, put my hand up and applied for the position, was successful and then commuted between Newcastle and Brisbane for five years waiting for my family to come up. And that's required living away from home during the week um, for five years. So I'm a, I've got a fair commitment towards evaluation. I'm very strong in um, the advocacy for academic staff and I've had a very strong relationship with um, Queensland University of Technology where we are about um, supporting academic staff to do a very good job in, in their area and to actually reduce some of the complexity. So having given that int introduction, I'm, I'm challenging you to ask me questions that I haven't heard before because I've had a long conversation with, with academics at, at our university. So I want five questions. So is anybody prepared to give the first question? And of course, no question is trivial and no question is to be um, not received with respect. So anybody like to be challenged to give the first question? Well, you've certainly heard it before, but how does one get a decent student evaluation on a voluntary basis, which by my definition would be by model, um, that is actually going to be an accurate representation of the teaching capacity? Okay, so, and we're talking about a student evaluation <coughs> being a survey. So a student survey, which is by invitation, yeah. how is that an accurate representation of your teaching, quality yes, teaching? if it is voluntary only. So if they've basically got to go out of their way to, yep. to do it. Okay. In so case, they would be either grumpy or lovey. Okay, so there's <laughs> question one. Question two. Um, mine's related to that, but I would remove the word uh, voluntary and all that stuff, I would just say, is a student satisfaction survey an adequate uh, evaluation of, of teaching quality? Yes. 
how can we implement sustainable teaching or sustainable efforts in such a well, more or less very short term student evaluation where positive, the positive effect of the teaching may not be popular in the first instance but on the long term? Sorry, it's how do we go about sustainable effort in teaching? Yes, sustainable effort that's not short term popularity but possibly long term popularity. Yep. I have, Jack, are you writing as well? No. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm okay, but question four, remember your questions so to make sure we come back to them. If you're going to implement um, academic evaluation, teaching evaluation, how do you overcome the cultural resistance to their change? The cultural resistance for academics or students? So how do you implement academic evaluation to overcome and, and overcome the resistance, the cultural resistance? So is that correct? Yeah. Overcome cultural resistance. Okay. Last one, question five. And I've picked five just because I could pick five. Uh, is there good evidence that students can actually evaluate the quality of teaching in their <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you for that, volunteering, no names attached to the questions. Um, one of the things that I think you should, uh, I don't know if it's comforting to know I've heard the questions before, um, or it is comforting to know that you're not alone in those questions. Uh, you know, there's a sort of a, there's a balance there where you think, well, it's a shame that we're all in the same position. Okay, so seven years ago, eight years ago when I started at Queensland University of Technology, I came into a single survey system. There was a fantastic policy, and the policy environment has not changed in that time. So go to our policy, it's, it's robust. It says you must use multiple lines of evidence to evaluate teaching. That's it. That's the po it's a really short policy, but that's it. What we found is we had a fantastic, really robust policy environment. And what was within that is we actually, at a corporate level, we only supported a single survey. So as you can imagine, the single survey took precedence over everything. So what had happened is there was a survey called the Learning Experience Survey, which was the, which was the unit and the teacher put together. It ran QUT, um, is very well known for overdoing it. So it ran every teaching period, every semester, every year every time it was run. So if you're in business and you ran three times a year, you were surveyed three times a year. So we had a lot of data. That was lovely. They did employ me and a, and a, and a group to help use that data, so that was a very positive thing. But what happened was that um, the data is, is open to misuse. And there is no doubt that misuse is sometimes in the form of um, for example, sessional staff. It might be used in the form of a, an employment requirement. Um, and although there is anecdotal feedback, nobody ever gave me that information in writing, if it was brought to our attention, we would investigate everyone because that was completely outside our policy area. You are required to evaluate teaching in multiple lines of evidence. The other thing is evaluation is not an employment tool. Okay, we have very, very sound ways to employ people, which is by um, open invitation and they can apply, they can meet criteria, they can go to a panel, there can be expressions of interest. There are ways to do employment, which is not exactly what um, evaluation is used for. Evaluation can, can inform a line of that, but it should not be the single uh, the employment tool. The other thing that we found is that with this tool, it ran with regularity and it was okay. We got five years of data, which was wonderful, because in five years of data, we knew that over, across an institution where we have over 45,000 students, we knew that the teacher evaluation satisfaction rating always sat 0.5 of a Likert scale on a Likert scale of five above the unit satisfaction. We were very comfortable that what was going on across the university is we were doing very good teaching. So it gave the executive a great deal of confidence about what was going on. So I'll talk about why we, why, why we made a change and I'm going to talk through the journey of where we are. And I'll at some point talk to you exactly about what that flyer that I've handed out. So we had triggers for change. 
So we have a legislative requirement in Australia that you will collect data and you will collect it annually and you will do it at subject level. And you need to be able to identify the academics at that level as well. So there had to be something around the teachers. So we can't turn it off, okay? Um, one of the criticisms um, was that the, a system, that the system was actually done to academics. In our system, it was an online survey that ran whether you wanted to or not, whether you read it or not, you didn't have to read anything, but whether you engaged with the process or not, it was, it was viewed as being done to you rather than for you. So it wasn't actually meeting the needs of the academics. It wasn't telling them exactly what they wanted to know. And the criticism, and this is in our policy environment, there is no requirement for teacher evaluation to be included in your promotion application. So there is no policy environment in, in promotion at QUT. But still, you, an academic was reduced to a, an overall satisfaction that could be grouped at the academic level or it could be grouped at the unit level. And academics felt that that was an oversimplification and definitely our new Deputy Vice-Chancellor <coughs> Learning and Teaching, Professor Susie Vaughan, was very keen that that simplification was not, was not fair, nor was it actually correct. So basically, now you're not supposed to read all of this, but what this is, my Deputy Vice-Chancellor comes from fashion. So she loved, the, <laughs> she loved the butterfly metaphor. And I've presented once before and somebody said, but my, my, um, my executive dean's an engineer and, and I could hear my project officer in the background go, well, just build a plane. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, the metaphor is whatever you need it to be. But basically it reads left to right and it's actually a design led. So we, were, we had the executive support and this, I, can't, I cannot say how um, critical it is to have the executive of the, of the university behind you. So basically we went into a five year process. And we thought it was a three to five year body of work, but it's a five year body of work. So it's not to be taken lightly. And it takes a lot of goodwill, collaboration. It doesn't take a lot of money. What it does take is that cultural perspective that you were talking about before. It's about everybody believing in the, in the journey that you're going to go on. And I know people use journeys. The reason we've got a butterfly is if you don't do all of these aspects, if often people just do the middle thing, which is they build the product, which is the reframe. No, I'm not supposed to walk away, am I? Hang on. They build the reframe in the middle. And so what it is, is you can often just go and build the system, which is what we did last time, and then just disseminate it and everybody's going to get on board. But what you're doing here is you're starting on the left-hand side and you're actually going about your stakeholder engagement. Now on the left-hand side, it's collaboration and, and engagement. Now we had 15,000 instances of activity on that left-hand side of the butterfly where academic staff, professional staff, heads of schools, executive deans, vice chancellors all came together at different points in time to work out what, what, what was it that they wanted. And the idea of reframe came from one of our graduate fashion students who prepared a um, PowerPoint for us to go out and do roadshows across the university and she from listening to what we were saying, she felt that we were reframing the perspective of evaluation. Now, reframe was the project name. We've tried to ditch it, but we've, we're stuck with it. Everybody at QUT understands that reframe is about re-looking at your evaluation, and that um, name has stayed with us. So what happens is we went out and did a literature review, and in Australia, and we did an environmental scan of what was occurring in universities in Australia. Everybody had a survey, they're all idiosyncratic. In the literature, it would say that a survey is not enough. It's, it's too thin a line of evidence and it, there's too many variables to impact on it. What if you're the, we've, you've just inherited a unit that's actually disastrously designed and then you're evaluated on that? And I think every academic has been in that position at least once in their career. If you haven't, you've been in a very luxurious position. Um, because it is the, it's the reality of what we do. So the other thing is we tried to come up with a theoretical concept and I have to tell you that they were wild and woolly diagrams. I have a Dean of Studies who loves to draw diagrams and you end up with 16 diagrams and you're trying to work out which one is in any way connected to the other one. 
So basically we came up with a theoretical concept that we could live with and we talked about having agency and voice but we wanted teachers to have a voice and students to have voice and unit coordinators to have voice and then to have something about um, the courses as well because at our university course level activity is a sort of um, subsumed within the delivery of the unit so we wanted to make sure that the courses had their space. But we had executive support. We didn't know what we were doing, right? Had no idea. People kept saying, what is it you're going to build? I don't know, it's design led. What do you need? So we, it was about meeting the needs of the stakeholders, not managing them. We had no preconceived ideas of where we were going. But what happens is we built Reframe, and this is the outcome, and then we tested it. But what we had to do is we had to come up with a communications plan now I have a communication budget of $45,000 a year. Um, we came up, we had to do training. Last year I trained um, 540 academic staff on how to use the data, what was important about using the data. Um, one year I went out and met with heads of schools three times, so that was 110 one-to-one -one meetings with heads of schools to introduce the framework. So this is not lightweight activity, this is serious <coughs> business. but. It is about um, providing agency to academic staff. And the target audience, one year my target audience was heads of schools because they're line supervisors. Another year it's academic staff. Another year it's sessional staff. So we try and move the audience around. And we are talking about ongoing improvement. We want the very best student experience that we can provide for our students. That's the core. That's what we're about. And we need to provide a safe working environment for our academic staff at the same time. So capability building, and this is me having a go at infographics for a promotion application. I won't tell you if it was successful or not, because it wasn't. Um, but basically it was me trying to say, how is it that we went about our business? The thing is that it is a, a, a journey that you go on and that everybody needs to have a voice and everybody needs to be able to say that they can actually acknowledge something on the framework so that it actually feels like it's part of their lives as well. Because it is about, teaching is personal, okay? So curriculum, I think somebody's in one of the literature said, curri moving curriculum is like uh, shifting graves in a graveyard. You know, it's highly emotive. But that's curriculum, <coughs> which is actually a little bit more objective than when it's your personal teaching. And so you can't discount the fact that it is personal and it, is, it has a great deal of impact on you and you put a great deal of effort into it. Therefore, evaluation should be sensitive to that. So what we did is, um, as I said, the five years. We had two years of collaboration, one year of building it, and I was on the working party. I was on every working party. I had to attend every event. I was on the working party to build the instrument. 12 months of fortnightly meetings and they couldn't agree on anything. And I didn't really care. <laughs> I didn't mind what the survey was. It was. There was no intent from the university to say what the survey question should be. But there was this, there was, it was really difficult. Everybody's context was different. So it was really hard to come to an agreement that everybody was happy with. But we, got, we did get there. But that working party really was traumatic. <laughs> for me. So this is our framework. Basically the biggest change we did is all teacher evaluation was turned off. All the surveys around the teacher were turned off and the university decided that they were very comfortable with five years of data, that their staff were doing a very good job. So what happened is they, we changed the performance planning and review policy. So these uh, students, oh, students, sorry, Academic staff are required to have a personal evaluation strategy and they need to speak to their line supervisor about that once a year. So we were giving agency to academic staff saying, you can choose your own adventure here as long as you choose something and as long as you're engaged in that. And you can demonstrate impact on student experience. So, the, so instead of it being done to them, the agency was given to academic staff. So, on the left hand side we've got surveys that are automated, so we do have surveys, and on the right hand side we have optional opportunities that we would validate to say to academic staff, you can choose to do any of these. So just quickly run through the surveys, they're all up online, everything's up online under my e-print, so you can find all of the papers that we've written and you can find all of the um, 
questions. Basically, we have a three question survey. The first question is about um, did this unit provide you with learning opportunities? The second question, academic staff insisted <coughs> remind the students they have a responsibility in the learning. So the second question is about whether the student engaged in the opportunities. And the third question is overall, I'm satisfied with this unit. Nothing about the teaching. The first pulse, the students, everything on this is a requirement of someone, okay? We must have a personal evaluation strategy because the legislative requirement, external requirement requires us to do something. The pulse survey, students wanted to have a say and, and can you improve this experience before I've gone, rather than wait till the end? So we have 13 week semesters and this runs week four and five. And on the Monday of week six, academic staff have, have reports pushed to them and they can see what the students are saying. And it's, it's about, how's it going? The second, question, the second insight survey, so that was Pulse, insight survey is the same three questions, different tense. And it's about how did it go? And it runs the last week of the teaching period and it runs all the way across the exam period because students said we don't have a say in exams. So it runs across the exam period and within um, a, the very, the survey finishes the Sunday night and the reports are pushed to academics on the Monday. The third survey is the exit survey. Students who were leaving the unit and withdrawing and weren't enrolled at the time of the deployment of these surveys have no voice. So these students said, we want to have a voice. So we have an exit survey and there's, there are seven questions um, from the literature about why students would leave, maybe health reasons, financial reasons, there's a whole range of reasons. Um, and we asked them, can you name the top three reasons why you've left the unit? Because it may be that nobody actually, it's not about the teaching or the unit, it may be personal issues. Sorry, um, do you not feel that you might be over-surveying students? And this is, it's interesting, we've just been through a review and the answer is no, because it's only three questions and an open comment. So it's really fascinating. We were only two and a half years into this. So I've got three years of data for semester one. The students who fill in these surveys are different students. And I find that fascinating because we have three, three surveys that run and this runs every week, week three to 12. This is week four and five and this is 13 plus. They're not the same students. So in, in fact, our survey response rate is one element, but the engagement of students is 10% higher. So it's actually quite fascinating. We didn't know this at the start and we were worried, like you've said, are we over surveying? We used to have a survey that had 15 questions and now we have three, three and your top three, but they're different students. Just in, in relation to that, can I ask how many units a student will do in a semester? Four in a semester. And they're, um, but they're collected together, they'll get one invitation and they can do the four together. Predominantly, yeah, they've got a single, they get a single invitation and it's a diminishing email so they only, once they finish them they don't get any more information. So it's actually interesting because the review, we were worried about that at the start, we just didn't know what would happen. Um, how many, like on average, of the students would um, engage with? These two or what yep. Of so 14% is the, um, so in the last two years, 14% for the pulse, 21% for the inside, and 5% for the exit. And of the exiting students, they can also nominate to actually, would you like student advisors to contact you? And about 20% of those do it. Can I just explain though that in doing that, this is the only time I've been in a, an environment where we have an increasing uh, response rate. From the first year to the second year, it's increased. From last year to this year, there's been a 6%. So the survey this semester, so previously it was 14% and now it's 21. Previously it was 21%, but this semester it was actually 20, uh, 29. At the same time, academics are invited and we get about 30 to 35% response rate from the teaching team. And the, their questions are, how, are your, how do you believe your students are going at this point in time? So we actually, you end up with, five lines of data out of a unit, two lines of participants, teaching team and students, and they're different, but I haven't had the data, I haven't had three years of data to do all the big data analysis yet, but it's encouraging because the students are using it more and they're leaving more comments, so they're actually engaging at a higher level. There was another question somewhere. Yep. Do, do, um Given incentives or anything for students, or just like a plain email after the survey and they go on. Yep. At the end of the survey, they're invited to, and this was um, 
we looked at a whole range of things. There is no evidence in the literature to say that incentives have any impact at any causal relationship with response rate at all. So if you can find any literature that says that, send it to me. But there isn't any. So basically, we go, give the students the, um, the choice to donate 10 cents to the student's um, scholarship fund or they can change, and that's the default, or they can change it and give 10 cents for every survey they complete to the student's food bank. Now I think it's encouraging that 50% of the students read till the end of the survey and actually make a change. So I know the students actually finish the survey at the end. But we've given um, $25,000 so far as part of this, and it goes to scholarships and it goes to, um, to the food bank. So the food bank's got about nine or $10,000 so far. Can I just, I'll just whip through this and then stop, I think. Um, on, the, on the right hand side, it's optional. There is a teacher survey that they can deploy if they choose. If they get the data back and they're not keen on it, you don't have to share it with anyone. It is completely private and confidential and we don't see the outcomes. Peer review, we have collegial peer review, so you can engage in peer review. You can choose all of these or any of these. Instant response, if you do something like tell me what's of interest to you, just stick a post-it note on the back of the wall, that would be legitimately considered an evaluation strategy by your line supervisor. We have existing data. We have, um, QUT loves reports, right? We've got course level reports, unit level reports, evaluation reports. We've got a consolidated courses performance report for the whole institution where there's hundreds of lines of data. So you don't have to do all of that. You just need to look at your data if you want. And then customise. You may have developed an evaluation strategy nobody else has done, where he, but your line supervisor can validate that that is actually a creative thing to do. People are doing good practice. It just goes under the radar. So that's, so that's the conceptual framework. It's just been to review, external review by the <laughs> University of Melbourne. And after interviewing 65, uh, stakeholders at the university, nobody has asked for the framework to be changed, which I think is successful. The other thing is they found evidence of widespread organisational <coughs> change. And that's a phrase I use in all of my literature, so I know that the external evaluators read the papers, which is really good because they, they rephrased using the same words that I'd use. So I think that's fairly successful. So one of the things I might just say is examples of success. The Vice Chancellor reads every comment from every student every time. So we get we print out a pack <laughs> I s and he's breathing down our neck. I only give them to him in print form because I don't I want to control how the data is used. So I don't give him digital copies, but he gets he flies a lot. So he takes his pack with him and he flies. Now he reads every one and it is fascinating and then he asks his executive deans, "What did you think about your comments?" So they have to read them. And the executive deans ask the heads of schools, what do you think about the comments? So basically there's this thirst to use the comments because they, they strongly believe that there are some things <coughs> academics cannot deal with. It must be an institutional responsibility. And we have had institutional change from that. Okay, I'll stop there, thank you.